Hello, my name is Eric Ferguson. Welcome to Recording Magazine's Fundamental Series. In this month's issue, I discuss the basics of sound, including sound wave generation and propagation. In this companion video, I will demonstrate the concepts and vocabulary introduced in the written article. In the text, I discuss how a kick drum head disrupts normal air pressure when it is struck. In this animation sequence, you can see how imagined air molecules squeeze together and then pull apart as the drum head vibrates backwards and forwards. In this process, moments of overpressure, called compressions, alternate with moments of underpressure, called rarefactions. These pressure variations then move outwards from the sound source in wave-like motion. The microphone, sensing pressure changes as diaphragm movement, converts this energy into electricity. When connected to an oscilloscope, or recorded by a digital audio workstation, the microphone's analogous changes in electrical voltage can be viewed as a waveform. In this example, a simple sine wave is derived from the drum head oscillations. One note about this drawing. Real air molecules are of course much, much smaller than what I've drawn. Also, unlike in this video, real world sound does not move air molecules very far at all. In this way, sound waves are very similar to ripples on a pond. The actual water molecules do not move much in distance, but they pass along the wave energy through compression and rarefaction. Sound waves, whether in air or electrical, are quantified along two axes. First is wave amplitude, which corresponds to loudness. When graphed, the size of the wave along the vertical y-axis is its amplitude. The unit of sound amplitude is the decibel, or as us audio engineers call it, the dB. When in air, the amplitude of sound is measured on the dBSPL, or sound pressure level scale. When sound is converted to a digital or analog audio signal, a variety of other scales exist. All dB scales correspond to how our ears hear sound pressure changes, and in the written article I discuss this phenomenon in detail. Here, however, I want to demonstrate what dB changes actually sound like. The first example is a 440 Hz sine wave at our arbitrary reference level. The second example is the same sound a dB louder. Now hear the reference again. Now 2 dB louder. The reference again. Now 3 dB louder. The reference. 5 dB louder. One last reference. Now 10 dB louder. You probably noticed that the 1 and 2 dB changes in level were difficult to discern. Don't worry, as this is typical. The good news is that although small loudness changes are hard to hear, perception improves with experience. This is especially true with material you know well. You might even be able to pick out half dB level changes provided they are important musical elements and in the mix that you personally spent many hours listening to or working on. Oh yes, one more piece of trivia. 10 dB changes in level are perceived by many untrained listeners as a doubling in loudness. Note that this is a purely subjective perspective. An actual doubling of relative sound pressure equates to only a 3 dB SBL change. Strangely, we barely notice such an increase. Here is a chart of real-world sounds and their approximate dB-SBL counterparts. While the range of loudness perception varies greatly between individuals, 0 dB-SBL is considered the threshold of inaudibility for healthy young ears. On the other end of the scale, 130 dB-SBL is often considered the point at which nearly all individuals find sound pressure painful. Speaking from personal experience, I find this number is inflated, as I find levels over about 105 dB SBL quite uncomfortable. However, I know many rock musicians that simply enjoy screaming SPLs well above my tolerance. This said, the threshold of pain is a fairly subjective measurement. Note that above 85 dB SBL, sustained exposure can lead to hearing loss. Louder sounds, such as rock concerts, can easily exceed to over 100 dB SPL, and even short exposure times can lead to permanent hearing loss. I highly recommend you purchase a dB SPL meter, such as this inexpensive model from Xtech. 
Getting to know SPL can help you control the volumes at which you make, record, and listen to music. Saving your hearing is important, as music making and audio recording are lifelong passions. As mentioned a moment ago, sound is quantified in two manners. In addition to amplitude, sound is also measured by its frequency. On a waveform graph, frequency corresponds to the x-axis. In air, frequency relates to the number of times per second the air molecules complete their compression rarefaction cycle. The frequency of sound is measured in hertz, and us humans can hear roughly between 20 cycles per second, or 20 hertz, and 20,000 cycles per second, or 20,000 hertz. Note that in the audio world, 1,000 Hz is typically referred to as 1 kilohertz, or simply 1K. Therefore, in audio engineer speak, we hear from 20 Hz to 20K. Of course, most musicians don't speak audio. In the music realm, frequency is more commonly referred to as pitch. In the Western musical tradition, we take this one step further and assign note values, such as A, F sharp, and B flat, to specific frequencies. In this example, I will play the line shown here on trumpet. Higher pitch sounds are of course higher in frequency, and lower pitch sounds are lower in frequency. Now here, as I play the same line again on flugelhorn, an instrument similar to the trumpet. The trumpet again. Now the flugel. Note that in both examples I am playing the same pitches, but the recordings sound different. Why? Well, duh, they're different instruments, shaped differently to produce different timbres. What's timbre? Timbre is, in musician speak, the tone of a sound. Both horns are of the same length, and therefore are tuned to produce the same pitches, but the conical shape of the flugelhorn's mouthpiece and piping make for a darker, mellower tone. Okay, enough of these musician euphemisms. What exactly in engineer speak defines a dark, mellow tone? In the previous animation of the kick drum, the waveform generated was a simple sine wave. Real-world sounds rarely look or sound so simple. In this slide, I compare a 440Hz sine wave with the waveform of a trumpet playing at the same frequency. Both waveforms are of the same note, an A concert, but they look very different. This is because the trumpet actually produces a variety of other frequencies in addition to the pitch we call an A. The A is the loudest and lowest frequency heard in the trumpet sound, and it has a special name the fundamental. The other, higher frequencies produced in a real-world sound are called overtones, or harmonics. In this image, I visualize the relationship between the fundamental and overtones against the spectrum of our hearing. The fundamental, at 440 Hz, is in red, and the overtones, placed approximately on the scale in purple, diminish in level as they go up in frequency. It is the presence and relative level of overtones that differentiates one sound from another. Your voice, my voice, a violin, and a tuba all have different harmonic makeups. This is the real difference between the trumpet and flugelhorn examples. The trumpet has a bright timbre, rich in harmonics. The flugel is darker, with less and quieter overtones. In the recording studio, we purposely manipulate timbre all the time by choosing different microphones or through equalization. Check out the trumpet again. Now listen to the flugelhorn. Now hear the trumpet, with the low-pass filter shown in the slide applied. The trumpet almost sounds like a flugel. Again, the trumpet flat. Now with EQ. In this last example, I want to demonstrate the EQ I just applied to the trumpet in real time. First hear a simple 440 Hz sine wave. Now I'll switch the oscillator to a square wave, Notice the rich, bright harmonics. Now listen to the sound as I lower the filter cutoff frequency. As I get closer to 440 Hz, the overtones are increasingly filtered, and eventually you hear the 440 Hz fundamental only. Here are two images I drew to reflect what we just heard before and after the filter. Again, before and after the filter. Well, there you have it, the basics of sound. Stay tuned for next month's installment.